Hey there, and welcome to the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Emmy Kirshner. I'm a serial entrepreneur, investor, and business coach for ambitious women who are boldly taking their business to the next level. And I believe that building a successful business isn't about working 24 seven just to merely meet a revenue goal. What it does take is a unique blend of dedication to purpose, courageous action, and frequently sheer will to overcome the odds that lead to meaningful impact and experiencing a life well lived. In each episode, you'll get to know the women and men who are unafraid to put it all on the line as they share the stories of success and failure that have made them incredible leaders and the magic they gift the world with. As you're listening, and I hope finding value, don't forget to share the Tribe of Leaders podcast with all of your other entrepreneurial friends and to follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast. If you have been listening to this podcast for a while, you know that over the summer I decided to really focus on interviewing only women entrepreneurs and business owners so I could share their stories help you find out more about what they're doing, how they're breaking barriers, leading the way so that you can join the thousands of women who are starting businesses and changing the way we do business. However, when I had the opportunity to interview Frank O'Connell come across my email, I normally, once I see that it's a guy, just delete it or tell whoever that I'm only interviewing women, but Frank is a very unusual person. He just published his first book, Jump First, Think Fast, but his background's what really intrigued me. He has served as the president of Reebok Brands. He's been the president of HBO Video, CEO of Indian Motorcycles, and the chairman and CEO of Gibson Greeting Cards, Inc., He spent the first 14 years of his career developing well-known brands like Arnold Bakery, Mattel, Carnation Company, and Hunt Wesson Foods. So he's had a diverse background, and he has consistently been ahead of his time in how he has solved problems, built teams, created incredible advertising and marketing campaigns. I actually had the opportunity to read his book before our interview, And it was, one, a super easy, super fun, fast read, but there's so many things that he had been, has been doing 30 years ago, 40 years ago that are exceptionally relevant today. And I want to be able to share that with you. So without further ado, please welcome Frank O'Connell. Hey, Frank, welcome to the Tribe of Leaders. I am super excited to have you on the show today. As I just said before we I hit the record button, I've almost finished your book and I love it. Like there's so many amazing takeaways. I have like a mental list in my head. So I don't know where I want to start, but let's go with diving into what made you decide to write the book. You know, about four years ago, I wrote a 250 page outline and it was just I started, it was just the stories of all of the jobs I've held and the stuff I thought was really entertaining. Uh And kind of what's happened over that period of time is, you know, a lot of people have been listening to the stories and my millennial sons and all of their friends have listened to them and kept coming back to me and said, how did you work for in motorcycles? And then you jumped to food and you jumped to video games and greeting cards and trading cards, you know, and they would be greatly intrigued by that. And they keep saying, you've got to write a book. Mm -hmm. So that's really what motivated me. And with a theme, and of course, that theme is trying to encourage a new generation to take risks. Which I think is so important. And your background really resonated with me because I've worked in catering and financial services, I actually worked for a marketing agency and aftermarket. We specialize in aftermarket motorcycle products. So when you look at my background, it's as kind of random as yours is in in a different capacity. And I'm curious, like, 
for me, that's really helped me with my clients because I can take different ideas from different industries and apply them. And I'm curious if that's the same thing for you, where you were able to take different strategies, different tactics and utilize them in different ways. That's most definitely, you know, there was a common theme, of course, for me was always the consumer and understanding the consumer and consumer behavior. But definitely, I, you know, I took a lot of information from one place and then used it in another. And people called that innovation. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right. And what is it for you about taking risks that's so important? First, I'm easily bored. <laughs> so, so risk taking has just been kind of a natural part of, you know, of my demeanor. And the second thing is I found, I think really early on, it was going to be pretty hard for me to grow personally or any business venture, anything else, unless I took risks and kind of thought differently than the other people around me. So, you know, I started to see that was going to be a critical differentiator for me in my career. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And when you were taking risks, were you concerned about potential failure or disrupting status quo or even, you know, if whether it was the board or the CEO or managers being upset? And how did you handle that? You're definitely concerned about that and you understand you know, the possibility, you know, of, of definite failure. But I found after the first couple of failures that I could bounce back. And everybody used to kid me. They say, Frank, every time you ever have had a failure, you have fallen forward, not backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I always, you know, I definitely consider that. But then when I'm running a company, I try to create an environment where my employees are not afraid of failure because if they're not going to be thinking, they're not going to be stretching their thinking and we're not going to be, you know, we're not going to be growing. So I've typically been in environments where, you know, they've been very forgiving when I made my first couple of mistakes. So <laughs> That is, I think, very lucky too, that you were just given that opportunity to, fail forward and land on your feet and be forgiven. Sounds like you live by the same kind of motto that I do, that it's better to ask for forgiveness than anything else. Yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm curious too, because you grew up in a farm in Ovid, New York, which is upstate New York. And I mean, your career has spanned decades and you've worked for, I mean, so many big companies Right. Not a lot of people have had the opportunity to live the lifestyle and do some of the things that you've done. How has being raised on a farm kind of created knowledge, wisdom, et cetera, for you as you built your career? Because to me, there's some natural ties. Yes. Well, you know, first, my father died when I was two and a half years old. My mother was a city girl from Buffalo, New York. Decided mm -hmm. to stay on the farm and raise my brother and I, who was a year older, because she thought it was going to be a good environment. Well, she encourages from the time we could walk outside and work with the hired men to do entrepreneurial things. So, you know, it was the 4A to the FFA. But then, you know, we started into, I had 600 laying hens and 3,000 broiler hens, and we bought machinery, and we were at crops, and she would take us to the bank, and we would go buy fertilizer and whatever. So my mother was a big factor in encouraging us to do things. And of course, you know, on a farm, nature is your nature is your risk so we clearly saw failure and recovered from it but it gave me great i think great confidence and a strong entrepreneurial experience and also some of the funny things were you know like i learned in the 4h is the president of 4h robert's rules of order which i still use in board meetings <laughs> <laughs> and what are the rules well, no, it's how do you conduct a meeting? How do you okay. form committees? I mean, it's, yeah, it's just great in electing officers and everything else. So it's still, yeah, but definitely the farm, you know, catapulted me into being 
and also very secure within, you know, my, myself, self-confident. Awesome. And then Cornell totally opened my lens to all new, you know, new worlds and fields and things, of course, that I never knew about or dreamed about on the farm. So, yeah. When you entered Cornell, did you know you were going to kind of visit or be on the path that you experienced? Or was it something that you kind of made up as you went along? No, I, I made it up as I went along. But I was very motivated to find the right path and succeed in, you know, in whatever I did. And I was very fortunate, you know, immediately at Cornell, I had a a couple of really great sponsors who really stuck with me and kept encouraging me. And they encouraged me to double register in my last year undergraduate and get my master's in five years as, you know, as an example. And, you know, that's how I ended up with a job with Jewel T one summer in RV, Illinois. I thought, oh, uh-huh. my God, what am I doing here? But, <laughs> <you know. laughs> and they just so I understand, like you lived out there for a couple of months and then yes, went back to school, my, right? Yeah, I took my young family, you know, out there and we got an apartment and I had my little truck in my warehouse and I sold staple grocery items to uh, 200 customers. And I highly recommend it, as I point out in the book, very few people who are in the consumer products business ever have spent time selling directly to you know, to a consumer. I mean, I learned a lot about life and I learned a lot about consumers in that, you know, in that summer. And that grounded me to say, you've got, you've got to stay near the ground. You've got to stay near your consumers. That's the way you get the intuitive feel and vision for products, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I sold jewelry for about six weeks in Pensacola, Florida, right outside of, or right after I graduated college. And it was the similar thing where, you were like expected to just knock on doors and businesses and definitely not my thing, but really cool to talk to people and get their reactions and also get really comfortable with rejection. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And to know like what they wanted. So I think you're very accurate in the closer the ground you are from in that. Yeah. And you uh, people say, well, what is your your skill if you're a marketing product development person or running a company or whatever. It said, you know, in the consumer products business, your whole thing is to understand and predict consumer behavior. That's really what your job is. What are unmet needs and therefore what products can I, you know, put in front of the consumer? So, Mm -hmm. So, but a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) What do you feel like the title of your book is Jump First, Think Fast. Why is jumping first so important? You know, that's the risk taking part. So, you know, that's the part where I say it's very hard to grow. And in many situations, you can't really predict what the outcome is going to be. I don't care how hard you study it, you know, how much data you get, you can't predict exactly what that outcome is. And what you've got to do is have a lot of self-confidence in your ability once you jump into a new situation that you're going to be agile and that you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to figure it out. So, you know, but if you just sit on the sidelines most of your life, you know, it's very hard to live a full life and really make, grow and make progress and lead a full life. So. Are there places that you wish you had jumped a little bit more or jumped a little bit less in your career or in your life? Well, let's see. You know, I'll say one place would probably be when I was running HBO video. You know, it was one of the situations that was perfect in terms of the video industry was growing. They had hired me to put me in over a CEO who they didn't think had the vision to grow the company. VCRs were growing like mad. Mm -hmm. And I brought together an incredible team of people. So it was like a perfect situation. And we grew like mad. We generated a huge amount of profit really for, you know, for Time Inc. So when the Reebok situation came, you know, we've always questioned if I'd stayed, everybody said, Frank, if you had stayed and gone into Time 
Warner, you would have been at, at the top and running that company. We just saw all of that. But, you know, so was that a jump I shouldn't have made? What might have happened if I didn't make that jump? So those are the kind of things you think a bit about. And any insight as to which way you you lean now as opposed to then? Or should have stayed or should not have stayed? Well, you know, well, probably because, you know, Reebok was a relatively short term. That was two years. And it was the pump. And of course, it was very high profile, mm-hmm. you know, you know, situation. But, you know, I honestly got fired. I had a brand new contract and I got fired, you know, for cultural reasons, et cetera. So I think, hmm. Yeah, if I'd stayed at, you know, Time Inc., I probably would have had a long, you know, interesting career in the entertainment business. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. However, you do have credit to an incredibly, I don't know if it's famous or infamous commercial at Reebok. Because you open the book with that and the two people bungee jumping. And I'm not a big sneaker person, but I remember that ad. So it has... I think stood the test of time, at least in my memory, and being really memorable to to do something that's so thought disrupting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was a very bold and risky move, as you know. I remember when I worked with the agency Shy Day, and I said, "I want you to develop a commercial nobody else would ever run." And I don't want you to put us on the basketball court with the pump because we'll never, the imagery of Nike is so strong. So let's create a a new playing field that we can win in. So we thought about, you know, running with the bulls and all sorts of things. And that's when the bungee jump, you know, came up. And of course, you know, it was so dramatic and it's, you know, you know, in, in the book is, you know, one of the three networks refused to run it. And it's the best thing that could happen to you. <laughs> because <laughs> of publicity, everybody ran to the other networks and it became, you know, it, it became a very famous, you know, campaign that everybody knew. And of course, we did a billion dollars in, in pump sneakers in the next 12 months. So. Which is pretty amazing because that was the... I don't remember if it was the late 80s or the early 90s. Late 80s. Okay. Yeah. 1989. Yeah. 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 So that's a lot of money back then. I mean, it's a lot of money now, but it's even more money then. Yes. And what gave you the confidence to do something so risky and so out of the box? Because it to me, it's really like it was very thoughtful in we've got to be doing something different than the competition in order to stand out. Yes. Yeah, and I think there was another very important, you know, sometime you go into a company and you've got a lot of time and runway to mm-hmm. turn it, you know, around. And in this particular case, I felt we needed to do something that was going to get high awareness, sometimes good or bad. I did a piece of research and we the consumer was not considering us at all when they bought Nikes. We had dropped off of the playing field. So I said, we've got to do something dramatic simply from an awareness standpoint to get back into the consumer's, you know, back into the consumer's mind. And that's what really sent me to the time urgency, you know. So we went, they were developing products. It was taking them three years, you know, and we developed actually that whole campaign and everything, you know, in about six months time, you know, and I developed a whole new approach to very accelerated approach to developing it. So time was critical. Yeah. 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 So how did you get everybody kind of behind the mission to shrink the time up to create the campaign? I changed the structure and there was a whole hierarchical development structure. And what I did is I had a SWAT team of five people report directly to me, you know, one who's, you know, design, you know, development, manufacturing in the Far East, you know, sales and the whole marketing plan and that team. And then I made very quick decisions so that we didn't have to go through committees and you know, groups and whatever, those five people made all the decisions and made them very, very fast. So we cut the timelines down substantially. Do you feel like you could replicate that in other areas and reduce time in different ways? Yeah. yeah. In almost every company I've gone into, I've essentially blown up their new product development process. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and designed new 
and designed a new one, you know, a much more higher speed one and also one where small teams and you give them substantial responsibility, including, you know, taking the fear of failure away from them. And then that way you can move much faster. And I use what I call kind of an air correct technique. I say, you know, we're in the development funnel with new products. Okay. What we want to do is get to the end as fast as possible. And then if we see and we launch a product and it's failing, stop. Okay. Stop quickly. Let's go to the next product. And also I use a lot of ideation, different ideation techniques to really open the thinking. And I do a lot on small teams and conducting ideation sessions. So you really open the flower in terms of ideas that have not been pouring into the company because they, you know, sometimes the people have just been working together so long, they're all kind of thinking alike, you know. Right. So would you mix teams up when you're breaking them down into smaller groups or... Yeah. And I'd look for creative people in the organization, which is sometimes down in the organization. So you find a designer someplace down and I thought, figure out I'm close enough to say, this person has got some really, you know, strong ideas. The other thing I would do is I would also sometimes lob in somebody from the outside who had a particular expertise. Let's say it's technology who may know nothing about making sneakers or anything else. I would put them that outside person on the team, you know, as well, so that we get, you know, some really fresh, creative outside thinking. Wow. So it sounds like you were constantly stirring the pot. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm curious too, because you've worked in so many different industries, is there one that you liked better than the others or that you enjoyed being in that, that fostered more creativity and risk? Well, there's no question, and I everybody kids me, but, you know, probably my greatest passion was my greatest failure, and that was Indian motorcycles, you know, the rebirth of Indian motorcycle. We're just both my wife and I are avid motorcyclists. We motorcycled all over the world. I have a very strong intuitive feel because of the thousands of miles in the seat and for the audience and the riders, but it was resurrecting a brand that I loved, an iconic American brand. Mm -hmm. So what was unique about that was it wasn't like working and it wasn't like working for a company. I mean, I barely thought that I had, you know, partners in anything else. It was, I was working to revive this wonderful, you know, iconic brand. So that's probably, you know, that's probably my favorite. Now, if you, you go to success is probably turning around the uh, trading card business that had lost 80 million and we spun it, you know, in a couple of years and took it public and everybody, that's where we took the risk with Magic Johnson after he was HIV positive. That was a big risk. That probably was one of the quickest, most successful turnarounds. Amazing. Like every story and every place that you've been a part of, to me, at least learning about you through the book, you have incredible stories and I think great learnings. So whether it's a failure or excess, whether it's, you know, you were able to turn it around or just revive the brand, I think is so amazing. What was your kind of general process or way of being when you were going into a new company, particularly, you know, in leadership roles? I'd say you know, a couple of things. First, I definitely had a game plan in terms of every company I went into, and that was starting with a strategic plan, you know, developing a strategic plan where we involved everybody in the plan. We brought in outside people to really understand what business were we really in. And there were some tricks in that. People were, didn't think they were in the wrong business. They didn't know it, you know. And then, of course, do all the study, you know, of the marketplace and then think forward and then what are creatively what are alternative strategies, you know, et cetera. And then that all translated down into, you know, metrics and agility, getting the right people in the organization, in some cases taking out the wrong, you know, the wrong people and heavy accountability, but, you know, very clear clarity on what our mission was, what our values were, you know, et cetera. But there's one thing probably that I'm known for when I come into a new company 
is the first thing I do is I go to the customers and the point of sale. And I spend sometimes 30 days just traveling in the field so that I've got an understanding of the consumer and the customer, my own intuitive feel. Relative, instead of letting five executives tell me about it. Then I get the entire organization together, you know, and I'm the new guy on the block. And so what I normally do is everybody is speculating on who you are and they're all trying to look you up. It's easier today to get the information figure. And I tell them who I am. Let me tell you who I am. I'll tell you about my family. I'll tell you my, here's my style. Here's what the other people I've worked with have said about me. Here's what drives me nuts, you know, et cetera. <laughs> and that's, you know, here's the way I'm, you know, I operate and I'm very extremely open. And then also say, look, you know, I also have care about the employees and their personal development is high on my list. So my door is always open to talk about your personal development and it will be in every performance plan. You know, it will have in it, you know, your personal development. So and then. I would constantly meet with them because I found there was nothing like gathering an entire organization in the cafeteria and talking. And then the other thing I love is I would open the floor for questions. And most executives hate that because they're terrified of the questions that they're going to get. I loved it. And often I learned a lot about this is what they really are concerned about. That I thought that this was important. No, that's not what they're telling me. This is much more important to them. You know, so that establishing that personal relationship and then I'm highly visible. Have lunch in the cafeteria, walk the floors, go in the plants and the baking thing. I would go in the plant in the middle of the night. So I knew the midnight shift as an example. So getting as close to the people as you possibly can so that then you can lead and that they will, you know, that they will follow. So it's a disciplined plan and then a real strong people orientation. Yeah, it sounds like you're almost ahead of your time in how you approach team building with one sharing openly who you are and some just personality and personal aspects of your life so that people kind of let their hair down and you know are already starting to like you and get to know you but then showing that you care and that you want to build community and collaboration as well yeah and also as you can tell i also part of my mantra is be fun have fun and I instill that in the organization. I said, you know, you've got to have fun and enjoy the environment and your cohorts and your people. And I use, would use a high dosage of, you know, humor. One of the things I would, would do, which was always fun for me. So when I got the whole group together, I'd say, okay, let me tell you the recent rumors I've heard about myself, you know, and then, you know, <laughs> and they would roar and I'd say, ah, da, 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 you know. <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great because it's, again, you're building that connectedness. And that's, for me at least, what really creates a strong organization, strong company, particularly when you're bringing multiple levels together and everybody's kind of on an equal playing field. Yeah, yeah. It's also, as you know now, it is essential to have this kind of environment in a purposeful environment and highly employee oriented by if you want to attract young people and young talent you just want first it needs to be genuine but you just can't compete for that talent unless your company has got the reputation of being a good place to really you know work where they really care about the employees and is enjoyable yeah yeah because you're spending a lot of your day there yes yeah oh, yeah it's got to be fun like that's i think the way life should be I'm curious also, you have worked all over the country and a lot of times you were moving every two or three years from East Coast to West Coast to Colorado to back to West Coast, back to East Coast. What was that transition like for you? Well, the transition was much easier for me than it was for my wife and my children, my boys, because I would always go ahead you know, sometimes three months in advance to the new company, of course, and I'm hyper-focused. And poor Barbara's got to, one, 
probably sell the house that we're in, mm-hmm. find a new a school system that's going to be good in a community, you know, that's going to be great, you know, to live in. But it's funny, as a family, and it's interesting when I set them down now and they read the book, you know, it created great flexibility. So they were very agile. They got a great, interesting schools. And in those days, they'd say, okay, dad, here's a new opportunity. But but they'd ask, do they have laptops? (laughs) 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 They wanted to know, are they progressive on this whole, you know, whatever. And so, but we became, you know, adventurous, but we also learned very quickly to adapt to the local environment, enjoy everything about it. The people around us, the schools are, you know, so we made the place feel very familiar to us and to be explorers and all the interesting new things. So, Yeah. And I'm just curious too, like what role did Barbara play in not only in moving and selling houses and I presume helping <clears throat> you buy the next place, but I know there were times that she helped with the business and I don't remember which she had bought, I think it was the software business or the video yeah. game business where she bought equipment, I think, and then leased it back. To the oh, company. Yeah. Well, I have to say it is quite unusual and Barbara is quite unusual. You know, she really was very much a partner in all of these businesses. You know, she knew everybody in the company. We frequently had people, you know, in our homes. We had big gatherings and Christmas parties and whatever. But I mean, and frequently, you know, if I'm trying to attract talent, it's a family and they've got to move to wherever I am. So Barbara would be key, you know, to working with the wife and the children and helping her pick the schools and integrate, you know, et cetera. But she knows these businesses and the challenges, I'll tell you, as well as I do. And she also was an executive recruiter. So when we went to the West Coast, she actually started, she formed an office, a high tech recruiting. So she knew a lot about business and the challenges of hiring people, you know, et cetera. But you're quite right. When we started the video game company, you know, I cashed in my check at Mattel, took the bonus check, put it in my pocket, and we went to the Silicon Valley, you know, and, you know, started Fox Video Games. I was fortunate. I got four million bucks for Marvin Davis, you know, who owned 20th Century Fox film corporation to back the company, but everything, you know, the office building and she found out, put all the systems together, you know, and was very, very involved, you know, in that, you know, in that company. And let me tell you, she could write the book. (laughs) When she hears me on these podcasts, she said, Frank, she just said, you know, it triggers 16 other things I remember, but it's critical because, you know, before I had been married, you know, and at the end of my first job, my wife at that time, who was very good and put me through college, said, you know, I don't want to be, you know, the wife of a junior executive and move all over the country, you know? So it's pretty rare, as right. you know, to have a partner that really is that flexible and will you know, make those kind of moves and constant adjustments. Mm-hmm. So it's critical. I say that's just such a critical decision. That's probably the most critical decision you'll ever make with your partner. And <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to relocate. I did that growing up. We moved every couple of years, really in middle school and high school for me. And I am so appreciative of the experience now because I can plop myself anywhere and, within a few weeks, really have it feel like home. But it's still a challenge when you're relocating and having to figure it all out over and over again, too. Yes. Yeah. So she sounds like, Barbara sounds like an amazing woman. Well, she is. And everybody who knows her says that she's a pretty amazing woman. So they, and they love the pieces, the little stories, of course, in the book about Barbara. But yeah, she is. Yeah. What do you feel is the most important thing for executives and business owners to know and understand now through all of your years of experience? Or you wish they knew people were doing more effectively? Well, you know, I would normally, you know, I take everybody through, I say, you know, understanding the importance of a strategic plan and having that whole guidance and power steering up front is so absolutely critical to get everybody, you know, aligned, et cetera. 
But I'll say one thing. There is a wave, a tsunami that's coming through right now that I think is really important for executives to understand. And somebody asked me about that yesterday. And this is the switch. I grew up in an environment where we totally focused on the shareholder. It was, who do I work for? We all work for the shareholder and the shareholder returns. And, you know, we got to do anything we can to generate these earnings in this quarter and get the stock mm-hmm. price up. Or even if you're a private company, you work for the, you know, the private equity firm. And now what I see is a, a significant shift and the focus now really being on your stake holders and it's real to me and that is of course the number one is your is really your employees so i see now to be really successful you really got to understand how are you going to you know build in or make sure that you've got a mission and a vision you know and a purpose that really you you didn't drop on your employees that they really believe in and that motivates them and drives it and are you really giving you know back to the outside world so my feeling on that is you won't unless you have that now first shareholders are demanding it. shareholders are starting to make decisions on gee i want to invest in a company where i think the employees are happy productive you know etc then secondly you're just not going to recruit great talent now in this environment between millennials and z's unless you have really created that environment and there probably is another big wave that's happening underneath and that's entrepreneurs and you know a lot of i think millennials and now just the beginning of z's were just either unhappy with what they're currently doing and even older people you know are really turning you're seeing i mean so many young entrepreneurs now are coming to me and i would say that's quadrupled over you know the last at particularly two years and of course what's happened you got the boomers retiring and a lot of the millennials now the boomers are selling their companies to the millennials <laughs> so, exactly. so yeah so i mean that that shift from shareholder to stakeholder is critical. Yeah, I love that because that's how I feel. And what I'm seeing in the marketplace too is it's really, it's using different measurements to evaluate what's success and where we want to devote time and energy to expand our people and the productivity and the performance of them. Because in my head, that's going to lead to greater profits. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm really curious too, like what what's next for you? you the book was just launched end of October, if I'm remembering correctly. So what's on your horizon? Because you're super active. Well, you know, I have this toy company called Shilling that we've had for six years. I mean, and it is it is doing extremely well. I was involved initially with it. I ran it for a short period of time to get the teams in place and the strategy in place. I'm a major investor in it. And now we're doing all these acquisitions, et cetera. And so as you know, new products fuel me. So you would love this. The We have a product that the group developed called Nido, N-E-E-D-O-H. It's a compression ball. We are selling millions of units. It's in every toy store, every mass market store in the country. And then we just bought a year ago the Lava Lamp Company, and we just bought the big, the old Big Wheel Company. So we're reinventing a lot of these old products. So I spend my days there also worrying about we're in 90 plants in China, all of that stuff, et cetera. So right now that I'm hyper focused on you know, the growth of that, the growth of that company. But I'm constant. I'm spending a lot of time with entrepreneurs. So tomorrow, for example, I'll spend the day with a woman in Boston, a young woman who has created a company. It's a knitting company. And she has an NFL license and she has done $13 million in two years. And now it's wondering, how do I take it to the next level? So I get involved in a lot of those situations of, you know, trying to help entrepreneurs. How do I get to the next level? And I do invest in myself as well. So it sounds like you have several full-time jobs. 
<laughs> I do. I do. And of course, nothing is more fun for me than spending a day in the toy company doing nothing but idea generating and being a kid, you know? So. Right. Right. And I can't believe you're going to bring back the big wheel. That was like my favorite toy on the planet. Well, we'll reinvent it in really interesting ways. So. <laughs> and you want to hint at anything? No, I can't, but you'll see the releases will begin in the next year. So Okay, super cool. So where do your ideas come from? You know, I can't. It's like a kaleidoscope. It's hard. Everything, you know, yeah, I see it's like this radar screen that's constantly going around. And about anything, you know, can trigger me. And frequently, I keep just a notebook next to me, and I, I write the ideas down. I do little drawings and whatever. But, I mean, in the morning, you know, I first... I get up early in the morning. I work out every single day because I think it's so important to your mental health and fueling a positive day. But, you know, that I immediately started thinking, or, and I watch the news feeds and almost any one of those or the podcast, bingo, I see there's an idea. There's an opening for a product. There's a need. And then I'll start kind of working with that. And I will, what I love to do is conceptualize. So I will frequently write it up and I will send it to my friends or, you know, whatever and see if we, you know, if we can get things, you know, get things going. So, yeah. So do you keep track of all your ideas? No, you know, I always think it's that your best ideas will keep coming to the surface. Okay. So I really, yeah. So I really let that happen. So I may have forgotten about an idea for a while and suddenly something else triggers it. And I see, you know, other interesting support for it. Or I see, I'll say in the trends, a lot of, you know, I look at, I love looking and reading about trends and research on trends because that triggers an awful lot of my you know, of my thinking. So it sounds like you have a very creative mind. I do. And somebody said to me uh, yesterday, it's not infrequently, though, people will say to you, Frank, would you ever diagnose as being ADD? You know, <laughs> and I said, you know, I hire ADD people because they frequently have brilliant ideas. The organizational piece I can put underneath them, you know. Yeah. And my experience is a lot of entrepreneurs have or kind of run on that ADD, ADHD spectrum yeah. too, because they have all these ideas, which sometimes is great, but without the organizational structure, then they're going from one idea to the next and not finishing. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I just put out a note. and I, I love this when I put it out on the internet or whatever, LinkedIn, I said, you know, I never met a successful, well-balanced entrepreneur. Yes. And I say it to me. <laughs> yeah, right. So we all have to be in our zone of genius and our, our little area of quirkiness. Yes. But yeah. I get a lot of ideas from other people. I'm big on idea generating sessions and I love putting those together and building off and getting people to build off of each other's ideas, springboarding off of other ideas. And then the other thing is, you know, executives say, some executives say, you know, I'm just not a creative person, but one of the important things, you may not be creative, but can you recognize a great creative idea? It's as important to be able to recognize it as it is to create it. So Yeah, absolutely. And then be able to take it and run with it as well. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Frank, this has been amazing. And I'm so appreciative of your time. Share with everybody where they can get the book, which again is Jump First, Think Fast and then where they can connect with you. We have a website, jumpfirstthinkfast.com. It's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And they're also just releasing now, the audio version has just been released in the Ooh. last day. So that is now, you know, now available. So okay. jumpfirstthinkfast.com. My website will tell you exactly, you know, how to get the book. And so. Awesome. Thank you. As I said, I so appreciate it. I've loved reading it. There's so many amazing lessons in it, in every story. So again, I appreciate your time. And you know, my mantra is be fun, have fun. Absolutely. Right? Like why else? <laughs> Thank you so much for being a listener of the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am so grateful for each and every episode that you tune in and listen to. And I hope that you get a ton of value that you can implement starting today. 
And I do have just a quick favor. If you wouldn't mind hopping on to wherever it is that you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating and review, it would help us tremendously so that the Tribe of Leaders podcast can be found more easily and help inspire other entrepreneurial leaders. Thank you so much for being a listener of the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am so grateful for each and every episode that you tune in and listen to. And I hope that you get a ton of value that you can implement starting today. I do have just a quick favor. If you wouldn't mind hopping on to wherever it is that you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating and review, it would help us tremendously so that the Tribe of Leaders podcast can be found more easily and help inspire other entrepreneurial leaders.